East Asia has a serious problem. It is in the beginning stages of a demographic implosion caused by a plummeting birth rate far below replacement levels. From Seoul to Shanghai, Tokyo to Taipei, nowhere is safe from the illudible reality of population decline. So why are East Asian couples deciding to have less children? Why does China have 34 million more men than women? And why does Japan sell more adult diapers than infant ones? We begin our story in 1950s communist China under the authoritarian leadership of Mao Zedong. In January 1958, Mao ambitiously announced his second five-year plan, the Great Leap Forward, a plan with the intention to turn China from an agrarian society to an industrialized nation that could rival the United States and the Soviet Union. However, the Great Leap Forward was ultimately unsuccessful due to a combination of ambitious yet unrealistic goals and misguided policies, such as Mao's Four Pests campaign, which incentivized the extermination of pests that were responsible for the transmission of disease and the consumption of crops. This caused an immense ecological imbalance. The mass extermination of the humble sparrow created the ideal environment for a surging locust population that decimated farmland due to the newfound absence of a natural predator. In addition, insufficient farming and the diversion of resources to tawdry steel furnaces exacerbated the crisis, while exaggerated agricultural production reports masked the actual food insufficiencies. These injudicious policies, orchestrated by Chairman Mao, led to the biggest famine in history. Although numbers vary, it is estimated that 30 million people died of starvation during the Great Chinese Famine. This event irrevocably changed China's future due to the volatility of fertility during this time. But if we fast forward in time to the year 1980, we arrive at China's second fecundity failure, the One Child Policy. As the West was starting to implement more economically liberal policies, Deng Xiaoping, who was now the leader of China, wanted to implement his own economic reforms, despite the obvious contradiction of a capitalist system in a communist country. However, these reforms came at a price. Deng Xiaoping was worried that population growth in China would affect the implementation of his economic policies. Although Deng's market reforms proved to be successful, the one-child policy produced consequences beyond the goal of reducing China's overall population. For example, traditionally, male children have been preferred, particularly in rural areas, as sons inherit the family name, property, and a responsibility to care for elderly parents. Modern-day China now has a significant gender duality, where there is now an additional 34 million more men than women. For context, that's almost the population of Saudi Arabia, with a population of 36 million. In addition, China faces a significant demographic imbalance, characterized by an aging population. As the percentage of elderly citizens grows, the workforce diminishes, hindering the economic productivity and straining social welfare systems. This insidious demographic shift places increased pressure on healthcare services and pensions, threatening long-term financial stability. If not managed correctly, China could face a reality far worse than many aging European countries, such as Italy, Portugal, and even Spain. This brings us to the modern day. Xi Jinping, who is now the current leader of China, has a significant problem on his hands. In China, large metropolitan cities such as Shanghai have an unsustainable birth rate of 0.69, far below replacement levels of 2.1. With options exhausted, President Xi removed all legislation which dictated how many children Chinese citizens can have. However, experts assert that these policy changes were made far too late. Lily Kuo, former Beijing bureau chief at The Guardian, stated that these efforts appear to be too little, too late, in her article for The Guardian. Additionally, Yi Fu Shan, a senior scientist and demographer at the University of Wisconsin, expressed how China should have stopped the policy 28 years ago. Now it is too late. But it's not just China 
countries such as Japan and South Korea face a similar fate. Shinzo Abe, former Prime Minister of Japan, who was assassinated in 2022, had recognized the severity of Japan's aging population and introduced various policy initiatives aimed at addressing these demographic issues, such as increased childcare leave, subsidies for families with multiple children, and support for single parent households. It remains unclear if these new parental incentives will be beneficial. And then there is South Korea, with the lowest recorded birth rate globally. When you compare the South Korean birth rate with other nations, you begin to realize what a predicament South Korea are in. The country of Nigeria, for example, has a birth rate of 5.31 at the time of recording. Contrast this to South Korea's birth rate of 0.72. It appears that young adults in Korea are choosing to prioritize their careers over marriage and procreation. In addition, the South Korean government has even tried to play Cupid by arranging mass blind dates in a futile attempt to reverse the country's demographic woes. And even on the other side of the Korean demilitarized zone, Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, was even reduced to tears when addressing the women of North Korea about falling fertility rates. Now it's time to address the elephant in the room. Immigration. One significant challenge hindering East Asia's ability to attract high-value migrants is the pervasive language barrier. Unlike many countries where English serves as a global lingua franca, East Asian countries typically speak in languages that are difficult to learn and are rarely spoken outside of their motherland. For example, the language of Korean is only natively spoken in two countries, South Korea and, um, yeah. In addition, East Asia has traditionally demonstrated a reluctance to fully embrace immigration, especially contrasted with Western nations such as the United States. Historical experiences such as Japan's Sakoku and isolationist foreign policy that banned nearly all foreign nationals from entering Japan. This era of solitude lasted over 200 years and officially ended in 1853 due to the arrival of American Commodore Matthew Perry. These periods of solitary existence have fostered a desire for strong social cohesion and cultural homogeneity. Therefore, many East Asians fear the proposition of increased migration. In conclusion, East Asia must make a choice. Remain homogeneous and endure the reverberation of a declining birth rate. Or accept more migration and risk diluting their culture and traditions. Let's just hope East Asia can play their cards right. But I guess we'll just have to wait and see.